and welcome. If you're a woman watching this, and particularly a young one at that, you should be careful because there's someone who wants to keep you in the world of engineering that you perhaps started with and are perhaps contemplating getting out of. I'm joined by Anjali Aroda, Vice President at Allscript. Anjali, a fascinating story that you were telling me. You were uh, in a large class of 30 students doing masters in computer applications in Delhi University, and there were 27 women and just three men. Right? And that must be a record for any university in the world. And yet that's a, an astounding fact and yet disheartening because most of those 27 women aren't around in the workforce anymore. And that's really where our conversation begins and the challenge that you face. Tell us about it. Uh, it is. I mean, and it, it saddens me every day and it's not just that batch. Uh, Delhi University was actually known for in the MCA um, course. They, every year they took 30 students and every year girls would exceed the boys. And, um, and I do see most of those women um, give up at some point um, in their life and that you can see happening a lot. It actually happens more in India mm -hmm. than it happens abroad. It does happen everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think women struggle with um, their work-life balance. They struggle with challenges that come to them when something changes in their life. So, you know, there are these milestones that they go through, um, getting married, having a baby, having another baby, living with in-laws, um, kids going to school, not, and they have this, Indian women, uh, especially I think we, the way we are raised, um, we are raised uh, and we are taught that we have to make our family happy and we have to make our, you know, Pati Parmeshwar mm. and uh, keep the children happy. So, there's this tremendous guilt feeling that most women find very hard to overcome. And what happens is they keep taking on more and more and more and more at home. And because they want to work and they want to be successful at work, they keep taking on more and more and more and more at work. And in the end, what happens is they cannot cope with either. And usually what they leave is work because they can't overcome their guilt. Um, and really my effort and my desire has been to kind of uh, provide a platform for these women um, where they can share their struggles, get advice on how they can cope, uh, do simple things like learn to say no. You know, no, I, I'm not, I cannot take on more at home or at work. Somewhere you have to say no, right? Because you cannot do everything. Have a conversation with their partner, whether it is at home or at work. Sometimes it's just a simple thing, having a conversation with your husband or with your mother-in-law, right? Or with your bai who doesn't come every day and maybe firing her and getting another one. Or having a conversation with your manager, right? And, and you're and saying even that conversation, uh, women a, are worried about A lot her. of women don't do it. Some of them don't have the self-confidence. Some of them, the, the guilt factor, right? They feel like, you know, what will my husband say, you know, if I tell him I have to work late today, and I won't be able to cook for him. And by the way, this cooking was a topic on my, uh, my keynote today. But, <laughs> but it is a real thing. It happens, right? So they will come home at late at night, and they will still cook the food, and, and then they're tired. Or they may wake up you know, at 4 in the morning, cook everything, and keep it so it is ready. But then they're taxing themselves, right? If they talk to their husband, the husband might have said, you know what, honey? We can get something from outside today. That conversation, a lot of times, doesn't happen. And I'm giving a very simplistic sure. example. Sure. I mean, there are a lot of challenges women go through, right? Their home environment might not be supportive of their work. Uh, uh, but I think a lot of times women are not making the choices and just kind of giving in to the pressure. And which is more in the Indian context than perhaps anywhere else in the world. It, it is a lot more in the Indian context just because of how the society is, how the society perceives women, women is, you know, women is the Lakshmi of the house and woman is the, I'm the data of the house and I'm switching it into Hindi and English here, but, sure. but uh, that is how women is perceived, right? She is first and foremost the caretaker of the family, right. of the husband, of the children. It is a li little different, especially in the United States. I've lived there for 17 years now. Um, yes, woman is the caretaker, but what I find is the man uh, takes it equal responsibility. There are very few men who will not, uh, you cannot really say the primary caregiver is woman alone in, in the US. I think that still has not shifted in India yet. 
I see people, right. right? You can you can see couples in uh, big cities where they are doing it, but if you look at larger India, it is still in that traditional. Right. Role. So you said this is. I mean, you've made it a mission of sorts for yourself and your organization. So tell us about what you're doing and how do you hope to change what you can change. So uh, what I'm doing is is actually a very small effort. I tried to start at all scripts. And it was actually uh, inspired by Griff Hopper and Anita Borg. Um, so I got introduced to Anita Borg about four years uh, back. And it was with a study which was about women in technology and how they either don't enter or if they enter, they quit, and how they are not in you know, middle management roles or senior roles. Uh, I kind of got hooked to that because I could see the problem. Mm -hmm. right? And it made me um, interested because I had been able to overcome it. It's not that I didn't fee face all those challenges. I did. Right, and being an Indian woman, I faced even worse challenges because I faced the Indian woman challenges while I was in India. And then once I went to US, I faced a different set of challenges because I was in a different country trying to make a mark for myself where I'm a minority. Right. Minority Indian and, minor and minority woman. Right. So it's a double, right? It's a double minority. So uh, that's hard. So I said, if I could do it, why can't other people do it? Um, at All Scripts, we started an uh, initiative last two years back. It's called Awake, All Scripts Women Aspiring to Kindle Excellence. <coughs> and it's really, and by the way, it's an effort started by the women for the women. So it is not really a corporate uh, initiative, but it is a women's initiative. And the idea is to provide a platform for women to um, you know, uh, allow coaching for each other, mentoring for each other, sharing of their thoughts. Uh, I would say it is mildly successful right now. Uh, one of the efforts through Awake was to get our women and you know uh, women at all scripts involved with Grace Hopper. And this year we are at Grace Hopper, and I think we have about 50 uh, women uh, from all scripts at Grace Hopper. And I was just uh, sitting with them, kind of debriefing, and I think their eyes have opened. They can kind of see, you know, hearing all the sessions here, I think they are realizing they have more potential yeah. mm. and more things that they can do. Right. So you're saying that the, the, the missing link, therefore, is the, is the mentorship or even in Absolutely. short doses? I mean, even... The, the mentorship, the coaching, and taking support from each other. See, what women don't do is they don't take support even from each other. Why is that? Uh, I think it is... Uh, I don't know. That's a hard question. I think women... Uh, traditionally have been uh, better enemies of each other than friends, somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, that is sad. Mm -hmm. That is sad. So I think being here has helped them. And what I'm hoping is that the initiative Awake will take on another dimension after they go back and it will help them right. have even better discussions. So let me ask you the larger question. So why all this effort to uh, keep women in the workforce or in engineering or computing as the case may be? So what is the, what is the, the idea is diversity, benefit? right? Mm -hmm. The benefit is diversity. Whenever you have a group or a team, or whatever you may call it, a collection of people, and you have diversity, whether it is in sex, whether it is in race, whether it's in religion, it can be in anything you get better outcomes. Because you have different opinions, you have different thought processes, you have different ways people think. And uh, typically you will find, and I don't have the statistics, there are a lot of statistics out on sure. the net, um, the more diverse the team is, the better it excels. Mm -hmm. And really, if the women keep leaving technology, we are not going to have diverse teams. Right. We're not going to have a diverse workforce. And that is just essential for uh, companies to do better. And, and you're talking about something at all stages. I mean, designing a product or a service Absolutely. to delivering it to... So at, e at, at each stage, starting from requirements gathering, you know, the way a man would think about requirement gathering and the way the woman would think would be very different. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when they develop, see, women tend to be stereotype, tend to be more emotional and more in touch with themselves and in touch with others' feelings. So they will probably think more about the customer and they will think about how will the customer use it or how will they feel it. The man is normally not as, so they will really be, give me the requirements and you know what does the business need and what will the business return. And again, by the way, you will find men and women can interchange roles, mm -hmm. right? Because they are different. But if you just look at that, there's two different perspectives to that same requirement problem. 
Right. Right. So, what about younger women who are entering the workforce in India, for for instance? I mean, uh, I mean, they too must be deciding. I mean, you were saying, like, for instance, earlier that a lot of women in the U.S. are not even taking up computer science, right? Yeah. And and the statistics show that. I mean, it's yeah. actually going down, down from a peak. Yeah. Uh, that's not the problem right now in India. So, what do we? In, what do you want? What do you think needs to be done to ensure that more women stay in this force? Uh, or remain committed to this force or enter this force? So I would encourage um, the companies which are hiring these women, right? A lot of them hire them as interns mm. um, and then they become like first year employees uh, to actually actively mentor and coach them to have formal programs. Um, and actually they can have a formal program targeted towards male and female both. But I think the female, the, uh, the women actually need some programs where they can get some coaching and mentoring from people senior to them in the organization who can help them and who can guide them uh, through it. And um, there has to be some accountability around these programs. Um, and, and really, uh, companies need to focus on diversity and they need to understand that diversity is going to be proportional to, directly proportional to the success that they have. And it is to their benefit to have programs and to keep the women in. And they need to have you know, some kind of programs, not just for coaching, mentoring, for growing these women. And I'm not talking about a quota system. I'm mm -hmm. talking about, <clears throat> at every point, giving them an opportunity so that they have the chance for the opportunity. So let's take an example. Let's say uh, there's, there's a promotion. There's a position, you know, new position at, a, let's say, a director level. Instead of just looking at all men, at least make sure the pool has some women in it, so they have the opportunity. And these are things the companies can do, right? They can set up mentor programs. They can set up some pool guidelines. We are not talking about quota selection. Mm. We are talking about pool quota, right? And these kind of things can really help diversity initiatives. Right. So, is there a story that you'd like to sh leave with? Uh, you know, someone who's going to watch this about you know the point that you know there are many crossroads. So tell us about one that you've been at where you could have gone this way, but you kind of stuck to the course or didn't change course. Uh, I think there's one I've been sharing actually in, in multiple th um, this thing. Um, this happened about, I don't know, six, seven, eight years back. I was in the US. Uh, my daughter was uh, not a teenager yet. Um, and you know, Indian parents, always have this, especially the dads have this, right? We should go back to India before mm. <coughs> before the, you know, the kids become teenagers because our culture. Sure. Uh, an opportunity came, it came to me where um, I was asked if I would like to go to India and set up a lab for a, a big multinational company and stay in India for two years. So that would have been a golden opportunity for us to relocate, right? Even if for two years and kind of test out the waters. And uh, at that point, we discussed in the family and we decided not to do that. And with that decision, actually, I remember having a conversation with my husband about it, saying, you do realize this means we are never going back. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he said, yes, we are never going back. And I said, which means that you know, if she wants to date, she's going to date, because we live in the US. We don't live in India. And, uh, and that was a crossroads. And we made a decision, and we stuck with it. And I think we've been happy with it. Yeah, and, and you're saying it's a decision driven by your part professional yes. aspirations as well. It I mean, is. Or are they largely your professional aspects? It, it, it was driven largely by professional aspects because what I found was uh, the support that I get in US um, from my peers and from my seniors, even though there's a bias, right? I was talking about that. There's a double sure. disadvantage of being an Indian woman. But in US, you still get more support and mentoring without even asking, which you don't get in India. You have a worse disadvantage here. And things like, you know, you can travel alone. You can go anywhere you want. You can talk to anybody. You have safety, right? I, I travel 80% of the time, and I'm in planes and hotels alone all the time. And I never worry about it, except when I'm in India. So, you know, things like that, um, they, they directly tie to the profession, right? Because at a certain yeah. level, you cannot grow if you cannot be global. Right. So it did, and we, we were happy with that decision. Right. So anyway, so hopefully things would improve in the, to the point that you feel comfortable and your uh, 
uh, family members feel comfortable or people like you feel comfortable to live and work here. Thank you so much. Thank you.